First off, I want to thank Mike McHugh. I also want to thank Nate. I saw Nate's, there he is, uh, for coordinating with me to be here tonight because it really is an honor and a privilege for me to have this opportunity to present to this team, especially being a Cal grad and, and always watching from the sidelines and, you know, rooting you guys on. So it's great to be here. Um, now, before I get in my presentation, uh, what I wanted to ask each of you to do is to pull out that sheet of paper and hopefully you got a pen. And uh, if you didn't, just make a mental note. But what I want you to do, I know it's going to be tough for guys in the back, but I want you to just look at my face, okay? And I want you to take a close look and I want you to just write down your first reaction, your first thought, whatever comes to mind. Just one word, a phrase, whatever it is. Just look at my face and write down the first thing that comes to your mind. And be honest with yourselves, okay? Because nobody's going to look at this sheet of paper except for you. And I promise you that at the end of this presentation, I'm not going to run around and try to grab them off your laps there and try to figure out what you said or what you said. Okay, so just write something down. Don't think about it very much. When you're done, just fold it in half and set it aside. And then we're going to revisit that later on in the presentation. So just a couple of questions. How many of you guys in here know someone today who has cancer? Raise your hands. Probably more than half. How many of you in here have had an immediate family member that's been diagnosed with cancer? Are there any cancer survivors in the room? All right, congratulations. Okay, so tonight what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you my personal story. I'll talk about what sustained me through the cancer that I had and the disfigurement that was associated with that. And then I'll talk about how I dealt with my adversity and how all of you can deal with adversity as you're confronted with it in your own lives. And then I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that I learned that are really lessons that I think all of us can learn from. And if not to learn from, at least be reminded about. And then time permitting, I'm an open book. You can ask me any question. I'm happy to answer it. So my story dates back to about 1980 when I was in high school and was really living life on easy street because I was getting good grades. I was an athlete and this this back in the days when our basketball shorts actually fit us on the basketball court. I was even a homecoming prince and don't laugh at that big fat bow tie. That was actually the style. It's sort of like the eight track thing. You had to be there. And I graduated from high school having saved enough money to pay my way through my first year at UC Berkeley. And that life on Easy Street continued for me right up through my junior year at Cal when, as the president of my fraternity, this whole series of events transpired that prompted me to finally go see a doctor. And the first was when my brother Steve came over to join me in going to a Cal football game. It's a true story. And, um, for those of you that might not recall, actually Cal was playing USC that day, okay? So you probably all recall that USC is always a formidable opponent. They always seem to be ranked in the top five. And back then, Cal didn't have the greatest program, right? It's not like it is today. It was probably, they won half their games, probably lost half their games. So back then, you had to get really pumped up for these games. And so I had this little ritual. And what I would do is I would run upstairs to the second floor, I'd open up my window, over the uh, courtyard, and I'd turn on the Cal Marching Band album as loud as I could get it. Now, this is going back even further than eight tracks. I don't know if you guys, it was actually an album, a 33. But um, I turned that up really loud, and I'm trying to you know, get everybody fired up for this game. Yeah, the Bears are going to win this game, right? I'm trying to get everybody pumped up. And then all of a sudden, I hear this loud knock on my door. So I go over and turn the stereo down. I walk over and I open the door. And it's my brother, Steve. Now, I hadn't seen Steve in quite a while. So Steve walks in, and he looks at me, and he kind of peers at me funny. He says, hey, you know, what's going on with your nose? Something doesn't look quite right. I said, what are you talking about? So I just walked over to the mirror in my room and took a close look at myself. And I didn't notice anything, so I dismissed it. About a week or 10 days later, I'm hanging out with a close friend of mine. We're just talking. He interrupts the conversation. He says, hey, you know, your right nostril looks like it's all flared out. Is everything okay? Brush that off too. And it really took going down to the Cal Administration Building at Sproul Hall to pick up my new picture student ID card. And I remember standing in line with all these other students, right, finally reaching the front of that line, 
and this girl handing me my card, asking me to verify the information on the card. Well, I wasn't looking at the information because suddenly I was taking a double take at that photograph because suddenly it was so apparent to me that there was something distorted about the right side of my nose and I couldn't believe that I hadn't noticed it when I shaved or brushed my teeth, but I did finally, so I finally made an appointment and I went and saw this doctor and that was somewhat humiliating because he was pretty quick to diagnose my condition as a pimple. Now, I was 20 years old, I had a lot of pimples, let me tell you. I was pretty sure this wasn't a pimple. But I was also 20 years old and I didn't think to question my doctor. So he suggested that I take Drixerol, use hot compresses, and if it was still there in three weeks, that I should come back and see him. So I pretty much ignored his treatment plan. Didn't make a lot of sense. Three weeks later, I'm back in his office. At that point, he decides it's time to do a biopsy. And as some of you may know, whenever you have a biopsy, it usually takes seven to 10 days to get the results, right? Well, in my case, one week goes by, two weeks, three weeks go by. Still no results. So I began to get nervous and prepare myself, actually, for the inevitability that I might actually have cancer. Four weeks, five weeks. Finally, I get the call and the diagnosis from my doctor that what I had was this rare form of cancer called a fibrosarcoma. And I was really fortunate that I got the right diagnosis because so many sarcoma patients don't, at least not initially. But I was even more blessed that I was then referred to UC San Francisco where I met my new surgeon, Dr. Crumley. And right off the bat, I liked this guy. He was just a good guy. I think there was a good chemistry fit. We understood each other. And he heckled me about Cal football all the time because he went to Iowa. And they were pretty good back then. But he did a thorough exam and he studied the history on my case and determined that the best way to treat my condition was with surgery and surgery only. So he went up through the roof of my mouth and along the wing of my nose to remove that remaining malignancy. It really wasn't that big of a deal. Four hour procedure, released from the hospital the next day, had a few stitches along the wing of my nose and I went back to my classes at Cal the next day looking like I'd been in a fight with someone, but not something. And I pretty quickly fell back into my old ways, started taking life for granted again. You know, procrastinating about my midterms, procrastinating about those papers that were coming due. Until about six months went by, and I began to feel these tingling sensations in my cheek. Kind of felt like ants crawling through my skin, and I just wanted to rip my cheek out because it itched so bad. So I made another point, went back to see my doctor. At that point, he determined that it was most likely a recurrence. Scheduled me for another procedure, and I ended up having an 11-hour operation at that point that resulted in the removal of half of my nose, the shelf of my right eye, the muscle and the bone from my right cheek, part of my upper lip, part of my hard palate, and six of my teeth. And I woke up attached to my chest like this because they had transplanted this full thickness skin graft from my chest to fill in this cavity that had been created on my face. And so when I was able to get out of bed for the first time, walk around, I sort of shuffled around the hospital like this, and everyone looked at me like I was some kind of a freak, which I guess I was, but I did it anyway. And at that point, the doctor told me something that I'll never forget. He said, Terry, I'm going to make you streetable before you leave the hospital. I didn't think to ask what streetable might have meant, right? So I just made some assumptions in my own mind. I thought, acceptable. And the next thing I thought of, actually, was Tom Berenger in the movie Platoon. Now, you guys see Platoon? For those that didn't, uh, Platoon was this Vietnam War film that came out right at that time in 1985. And in the movie, Tom Berenger had this big keloid scar across his cheek from this knife wound that he'd received in battle. So I thought, hey, you know, maybe that's what streetable looks like. If that's streetable, that's not so bad. I can live with that. In fact, a lot of girls kind of like that tough guy image, right? It might actually pay off for me. But his definition was very different than that. He was preparing me for this life of disfigurement. So I ended up having two more procedures to remove the remaining malignancy, and then I was released from the hospital. And it was really at that point that I began to realize the severity of the situation because inside of the hospital, I was very protected, very insulated. But outside of it, 
I was very vulnerable and very exposed. And that's really when I began to notice people pointing at me and people staring at me, children giggling at me. And I just wanted to start that reconstructive process as soon as I could, but I wasn't able to because I had to wait for everything to heal. I had to wait for radiation therapy, which I had. I had about six weeks of radiation followed by 48 hours of these iridium seed implants they put inside of my denture here where they cord me off in a room at the cancer ward with this yellow warning tape across my door because I was radioactive. But really what became ever more difficult for me in my recovery was the aftermath of the cancer. It was the disfigurement that resulted from it. And so over the next five to six years, I had another 25 procedures, and most of those were reconstructive in nature. And it really took that long for me to become content with who I was as a person. But it took a whole series of events to get me there. And to this day, a lot of people ask me, you know, what sustained you through this process? How did you get through it? And I would really attribute it to two core things, simple things, to the people that I interacted with, and to the events that transpired during that time. But first and foremost, you know, it was my family and my friends who were incredibly supportive, caring, nurturing, committed. But mostly, they were full of positive energy. It was my medical team. You know, my doctor was this incredibly confident and competent man who never expressed doubt that he'd get me cured of my cancer. He never expressed doubt that he'd get me reconstructed back to that old Terry. And at every stage in the process, I was sent to the best and the brightest specialists. And I had, actually I was pretty lucky, I had some pretty cute nurses along the way too. Myself, you know, I didn't realize how much inner courage and strength I could find within. And I'll talk about what I call my survival kit a little bit later. But you know, after having this series of reconstructive procedures and not really seeing any good results, I began to realize that I needed to have another purpose in my life beyond reconstruction, something that I had control over. And so getting that first real job when I finally graduated from Cal after about five and a half years was significant because suddenly I had goals, I had objectives, I had responsibilities, and for the first time, I began to feel like I was contributing to society again. And that was really the beginning for me of rebuilding some of the confidence that I'd lost, regaining some of that self-esteem I'd lost because I had really been on this long, long downward spiral. And for the first time, I was starting to feel like I was coming back up the other side, right? But I was still way, way down here, and I had a long ways left to go. But then there was <clears throat> really a whole series of events that liberated me. And the first was meeting this girl named Dina. And this is the only photo I have of her. That's why I'm showing you this. But to give you the, uh, the background on Dina, this is at a point in 1989, so now we're four years after that major procedure I showed you earlier, where I was going back and forth to Chicago to have this series of six reconstructive procedures just in an effort to make my nose symmetrical again. And on the sixth procedure, I went back there expecting something really magical to happen, right? Because I didn't look very good going in that procedure. But somehow I thought, everything's gonna come together and I'm gonna look great. So I had the procedure. And when I was done with that, I did what I'd become so famous for. You know, I, when I was able to get out of bed, I jumped up and I rushed into the bathroom. And I'd get all geared up. I'd look at the ground until I was good and ready. And then I'd look up in the mirror all excited. And when I looked, I just remember being so disappointed, devastated, because suddenly I realized that I now had new scars on my forehead that had been created in an effort to reconstruct my nose because I had to pull tissue down. I had new scars on my cheek created an effort to reconstruct my upper lip. And I really felt like I'd been taking two steps back for every step that I was taking forward. And that was really at the point that I sunk to a new low. But in that same hospital, on that same stay, I met Dina. And Dina, to me, was this gorgeous girl with this great attitude who took this immediate interest in me. And we began to see each other. And pretty quickly, our relationship became intimate. And I say that only because it was significant in that it was the first intimate relationship that I'd had with someone who didn't know me as that old Terry. But after spending this long weekend together, Dina just looked at me and she said, Terry, 
you have a lot of issues that I can't help you with. And you need constant reassurance. And I can't give you that. And so what she taught me really was that the scars on the inside had become far more disfiguring than the scars ever were on the outside. It really wasn't my physical appearance that was my issue. It was my person that was the issue. Granted, that was a devastating moment, but it was also liberating in the sense that it put everything into perspective for me and suddenly I began to realize for the first time that I no longer needed to find that next wizard surgeon who was going to fix my nose, fix my eye, fix my lip. Instead, I had to focus on rebuilding what was inside. And that's really when I began to search for a support group and I came across the wellness community. And the wellness community is this national nonprofit that's dedicated to providing support services for cancer patients and their families. And it was really there that I began to realize over time that I actually had an inspirational story to tell other cancer patients. And that, in turn, helped me to begin to feel better and better about myself so that I could finally start to take two steps forward and one step back instead of the other way that I was living before. But, you know, probably the most significant turning point was meeting my wife, Sue. Actually, I always say it, so scratch that. Definitely the most significant turning point was meeting my wife, Sue. I'll never forget Mark McGuire being on TV and uh, not attributing anything to his wife for his success. So uh, anyway, she was definitely the most significant turning point. And uh, we had two dates together before the topic of what happened to me even came up in a conversation. So that told me a lot about Sue. She really wasn't concerned about whatever happened to me, but she cared about who I was as a person. And that really was the most significant turning point because she really did accept me for who I was and to this day has never asked me to change. In fact, you know, I wake up every morning and I lean over to give her a kiss. And let me tell you guys, I'm a scary, scary sight in the morning. My hair is sticking straight up. My nose is crooked, my eyes droop, my lips pulled up, and get this, most mornings, I don't even have my teeth in my mouth. But you know what, she smiles back at me and she kisses me back, and never once in all these 15 years has she ever looked back at me and said, like some wives might, you know honey, maybe you ought to get your nose straightened out just a little bit, or get your eye lifted just a tad, because I could do that if I wanted to. But she's never said that. Now. The fact that I am losing my hair and going bald is a whole other issue that she's not too happy about anymore, but uh, I don't know what we're going to do about that one just yet. I haven't figured that out. But, you know, really the, the point in all these stories is that all of us need to be aware, alert, attentive to the people and to the events that are happening around us because they can and they will impact us. And none of us knows where we're going to get the inspiration that we need to help us get through our own crisis. But you know, there's another, there's another message here, and it's about trust and teamwork. You know, I would have never gotten through my ordeal without having an incredible team of people around me that I trusted day in and day out, right? Without my family and friends providing support every day, without a great medical team, without my first boss who took a chance on me He's a Cal grad, he took a chance on me and hired me when I had cancer into his small business. He took a big risk. Without Dina, who really <coughs> helped me to identify what my true weaknesses were and helped me to focus my life on what I could control in my life rather than what I couldn't control. Without all those people at the wellness community providing support and without my wife Sue, <coughs> would have never gotten through any of that. And I think, you know, you guys all know this, but you know, if you want to achieve something great, anything, you've got to have an incredible team of people around you to do it. You can't do it by yourself. And you've got to trust those people. Now, all of you guys will be confronted with some kind of crisis at some point in your lives, right? And you're going to figure out a survival kit on how you'll manage through it. So what I thought I'd do quickly is share with you what I call my survival kit. First and foremost, for me, it was my religious faith and spirituality it gave me tremendous courage and strength throughout the ordeal. But again, I, and I say this again, it was trust and teamwork. You know, I trusted my family that they'd help me to make the right decisions. 
I trusted my medical team when they told me they'd cure me of my cancer. I trusted my medical team when they told me they'd get me reconstructed back to that old Terry. Regardless of whatever the final outcome was, the fact that I trusted those people enabled me to keep hope throughout the whole process. I also became very focused, goal-oriented, right? I started setting all these personal and professional goals one year out, two years out, three years out. And I found that to be very therapeutic because I was always reaching forward and looking to the future rather than being caught up on the present and dwelling on my own situation. Certainly positive thinking. Glass is half full, it's not half empty. It's never half empty. Balance, eating right, sleeping right, exercising, trying to live a balanced lifestyle. Group therapy, you know, I talked about that, but being able to share with other people day in and day out, things I couldn't share with my family and friends, that was instrumental. And this last thing is visualization, positive imaging. Any of you guys employ that in your lives? Good, that's, that's actually quite a few. Usually when I ask that question, a lot of people kind of look at me like, what? But visualization and positive imaging can be a really powerful thing. I personally, I won't go through stories about how I used it, but I personally leveraged it a great deal. I would basically try to envision myself being healthy, being cured, being healed, right? And every day I would concentrate. How am I going to get there? What do I have to do? What do I look like two years from now? And what I like about it is that anybody can employ it, right? All it takes is a little bit of concentration every day and a vision about what you want to achieve, what you want to overcome. And you just got to think about it, concentrate on every day. How am I going to get there? How am I going to be the best at what I do? And every day, what can I do today that's going to help me to get there tomorrow? It's very powerful, and I think it's underestimated. Now, how do all of you in this room deal with adversity as you're confronted with it in your own lives? Well, first and foremost, it's kind of interesting. I think we all get a fresh perspective. It's really easy to reset priorities. Suddenly, you're not sweating the small stuff anymore. You know, I know that we can all relate back to 911 from six years ago or so now, but I can't tell you how many people I talked to after that event that were talking about resetting priorities, right? It's about health, it's about family, it's about friends. Those are the things that matter. You gotta dig deep, you gotta find the inner self, find that courage and strength within, because we all have it inside of us. It's really a natural human instinct, so you just gotta dig deep Search for those tools that are going to help you to manage through a crisis. Maybe they're some of the things I talked about or any number of other things. But the point is to try to remember what that toolkit is because you never know in life when you're going to be called upon to use it. And finally, really to me the most rewarding part about my adversity is I'm able to help others as a result of my experience. And I think if we can all look at adversity with a positive outcome, it makes it a whole lot easier to deal with, right? Now, granted, it's not an easy thing to do when you're in the midst of adversity to think about how great your life is going to be, but I will guarantee you that if you survive that adversity, you will be a stronger and a better person for it. And the point is not to wish adversity on anyone, right? But I got to tell you, I know a lot of cancer survivors, five plus year survivors, I've never met one of them who's ever told me that they wish that they didn't have cancer. And the reason is, is that it enabled them to reevaluate, to reassess, and to reflect upon their lives and try to make their lives more meaningful. So who am I today? Kind of fast forward here. I'm, I'm coming to the close here pretty soon. Um, you know, I talked about the cancer. It was compounded by the disfigurement. And at a certain point, I began to realize that I could no longer control the outcomes of these surgical procedures that I was having. I could no longer control what might happen when I walked into a room of people like this and somebody pointed at me. I could no longer control what I might say to that person, what I might do, how I'd react. I had no control. So I decided to step back and think about what in my life could I control. And I actually came back with a couple of things. But one of them was I figured I could control my work. Because I figured if I worked hard, I'd be rewarded for that. And I figured if I was rewarded for that, that would help me to rebuild my confidence even more, to regain my self-esteem even more. And so that's what I did. I focused really, really hard on work, found a lot of success in business, and by the time I was 30, I'd become a VP of marketing for a technology company. And I 
was a VP of marketing for two different companies over about a six year period and I left there about six years ago to start my own company. And today I run a company called Ridgeview Consulting and we provide technology marketing consulting services for companies like Cisco Systems and Intel. And what I like about what I do is that I'm working every single day with people and teams of people who want to make a difference, who want to make an impact on the markets they serve. But they're just like you guys, they're competitive as hell. You know, they want to beat the competitor down the road. They want to beat Juniper every single day. They wake up dreaming about how they're going to beat Microsoft. So it's very competitive and I actually get a lot of energy from that and I feel blessed that I'm able to balance that work life with my other passion, which is reaching people with my books and what I'm doing tonight and delivering what I believe to be anyway are some very important messages. And so as I begin to summarize here, <coughs> I wanted to share with you some of the lessons that I learned. And I don't think of these so much as lessons, really as I do gifts. And I say that because I feel so blessed to have learned so much at such a young age. And this isn't just another PowerPoint, right, with a bunch of bullet points on it, but it's how I try to live my life every single day. First thing is to take control of your life. Focus your life on the things you can control, but don't focus it on the things you can't. And, you know, put yourself in the driver's seat and don't let someone else set the agenda for you. Don't let someone derail you from your goals and your objectives. Second thing, surround yourself with people that you trust in your personal life and in your professional life. Third thing is to face your fears and your challenges, but you can't get overwhelmed by them because we all have a lot of them. So what you have to try to do is focus on one thing at a time. And the beauty is every time you face a challenge and overcome it, it gives you more confidence to face the next challenge. And finally, really, you know, I ask you all to try to be more tolerant, less judgmental every day. And try to refrain from making judgments at face value because, you know, my story is not just about cancer or disfigurement. It's a much broader issue for society to think about. It's people that have weight problems. It's people that feel discriminated against based on the color of their skin or their sexual orientation or whatever it might be. But we all need to try to look deeper. Look at the internal rather than the external fabric that makes up our human spirit. Now, I'm going to quickly revisit that little exercise that we started in the beginning. Don't look back at what you wrote before, but now what I'd like you to do Pull that sheet of paper out and that pen. And on the other side of that piece of paper, what I'd like you to do is write down in a word or a phrase what you think of me now. What your reaction is to me now that you heard me talk for the last 30 minutes. And again, I'm not going to ask anybody what you wrote, so it can be brutal. I don't care what you say, right? But I think what's interesting about that little exercise is that most of us, so don't feel bad if you did this. Most of us, including myself, make judgments every single day. When we first meet somebody, we make a judgment. But when we get to know somebody, our perception changes of that person. Even when we talk to somebody for five minutes, suddenly we have a very different perception of that person. And hopefully, in that little exercise, some of you guys might have come to a different conclusion before and after. So that's really the whole point in, in that, little, uh, that little exercise. But uh, really, I want to thank all of you for having me as a guest here tonight. And I want to wish you guys all the greatest success with the Cal football season this year, with getting your degrees at Cal, with going on to do whatever you're going to do. I really want to wish you all the greatest success. Go Bears. Thank you. I do. Dina became a, uh, she's actually an anchor, a TV anchor in Chicago. And um, so I, I go back there to Chicago on business or whatever. My wife is friends with her. I'm friends with her husband. She married her cameraman. Um, so we're still very good friends to this day. And, and uh, I always wanted her to know the impact that she had on me. And so it's great that, uh, that we were able to stay friends. Yeah.
Any other questions? Yes. Uh, it's called Ridgeview Consulting. Small consulting firm. Yeah. Yeah, when you guys uh, are looking for some stuff to do when you graduate, give me a call. What was that first job that you had? What was it that you did? First job I had, Nate, you know uh, Pete Jackson, right? Okay, Nate, I think, worked a little bit for a guy named Peter Jackson this summer or something, right, or last spring. Yeah. Um, my first job actually was, I wasn't making any money, but it was a job, and my opportunity was to go into a small fledgling startup company that was distributing computers, basically, when computers were very, very new. It's a pretty dirty, ugly business, right? And my job was to create a customer service department. Now, I had no confidence at that point, right? I did not feel that good about myself. So you're asking me to do customer service? It was a great challenge, and that's, Peter Jackson is this guy that it's all about competition, he's all about facing challenges. So I credit a lot to him, because he basically gave me this job that was impossible. He said, build a department from scratch. I know you have no experience, but figure it out. I knew nothing about customer service, I knew nothing about computers. I went in there the first day, and I am not exaggerating when I say this, and you can ask Peter. There was a stack to the top of that cabinet, out to here on pallets of broken computers, broken hard drives, all this stuff. Figure out how to get our money back on this, figure out how to get it returned, help our customers solve their problems. So anyway, that was my first job. I worked about 18 hours a day, and, and, uh, but I loved it. It, was, it really helped me get back on my feet. Yes? Uh, for those that didn't hear it, he said, do I ever think about going back and fixing my face still? And the answer is I could do that. There's technology's come a long ways. Um, I became content with who I was at a certain point. You know, as I talked about, I kind of reached that point of, you know, where Dina kind of came into the picture and I think helped me understand what's really important and what, what could I control in my life. I couldn't control reconstructive surgery. And fortunately, I kind of grew up and I think I, I came to recognize that I liked who I was, despite the fact that I was never going to look like who I was before. I was never going to be a homecoming prince guy again, you know. But, uh, so I have no intentions of, of fixing, fixing anything unless I have something functional that I have to. Yeah? How much was my uh, medical bills for all this? You know, I, I can't even tell you. I was really lucky that I had a dad that, that had good medical insurance for our family. And uh, so I was pretty well taken care of. I could go to the best doctor. And, but uh, I don't want to know how much it costs. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else, guys? Sorry? How long has my book been out? Um, I wrote a first edition of it in 2001, <clears throat> and then another publisher came along and I rewrote, changed it in 2006. It came out about a year, year and a half ago. Yeah. So it's, it's all about Cal, you know? And I'm not telling you guys to go out and read it. You've got, got enough to do. But uh, it's all about basically my time at Cal. So um, even though it was a tough time for me, it was really positive, great memories. I love this place. And, uh, you know, walking across the campus, I reflected a lot. And that's all in the book, so. Yeah, one more. What fraternity? Um, Zate House? Oh, sh I shouldn't have said. I should have lied, I guess, huh? Does they have a bad reputation now? Put it this yeah, we didn't, you know, I think we got kicked off campus uh, at the end of my time there. All right, Terry, thank you. All right.